So we basically looked at, we've seen what to pray for. We, we had a, a, a series on that. Uh, we've seen who to pray for. And then last week we saw hey, how to pray. And as we looked at how to pray, we focused mostly on private prayer. We, we saw the, that prayer is first and foremost an internal issue. You know, Jesus often did that. He said, you've heard this, but I tell you this. And he, would, he was internalizing those things. He said, you've heard this commandment and you're so focused about what's happened, happening externally concerning that. Well, let me tell you that the internal is really where the emphasis is. And if the internal is right, then the outward gets right. Amen? So we saw that with prayer. and We saw how to pray out of Matthew 6. Uh, we were to pray to be seen of God, not of men. Enter in your closet when you pray. Uh, we were to pray succinctly, concisely to the point, uh, not being babblers, not being stammerers. The word literally was there. Uh, you know, you're not going to be heard for your much speaking, remembering that God knows what we have need of. And then maybe surprisingly, he wrapped up the Lord's prayer there and focused, emphasized again that we need to pray for giving. Um, uh, we ran out of time last week, and so I wanted to begin with Job 42. Just read this verse. I, I sort of gave this to you as homework, but in case you forgot about it, I think it's worth mentioning here, uh, particularly along these lines of praying, forgiving. And uh, I just wanted you to read this with your own eyes here. I wanted you to see this principle. Remember the Lord said after the Lord's prayer, He goes back and He picks up this idea of forgiveness and He says, if we don't forgive, we won't be forgiven, right? It's that simple. Um, if forgiveness uh, uh, limits your prayers, it, it, it hinders your prayer life, and uh, it, uh, a lack of forgiveness will have a tremendous effect upon you. Listen to what it says here regarding Job. It says in verse 10, we know about Job's friends. We know how instead of being, he called them miserable comforters. Instead of being a help and an encouragement to Job, uh, they were busy pointing their finger at him. And in verse 10 it says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job. Now, the next phrase begins with this word when. So we understand that this turning of the captivity of Job wasn't going to happen until this right here takes place. What is the when? And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. When he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. So uh, it, it wasn't until Job prayed for his friends he had to do this with a forgiving heart. Right? How do you pray for these that instead of being your help and your comfort uh, have torn you down more, have caused additional pain? It wasn't until he prayed forgiving for these friends that Job's circumstances changed. So uh, someone mentioned this to me last week. They said prayer doesn't change God. Prayer changes us. And you see that here in Job's life. You see a change in Job. You're going to have to be changed in order to pray this prayer. Uh, it may be that the situation that you're in that hurts so badly, it may be that, that you're never going to come out of that situation until you're able to pray forgiving those that are afflicting, forgiving those that are hurting. That was the pattern that we saw here in Job's life. When he prayed for his friends, his circumstances turned around. So I, I, I just felt like we, we cut that short last week and I wanted to make sure that we visited again, uh, visited that again. Uh, also, we also said in, in the, uh, and I don't have this in my notes, but I just remembered it when I was talking about praying succinctly, concisely to the point. I want to be clear about that, um, that we're not saying that our prayers don't explode into praise, that, that there aren't times that we're just overflowing with praise and we're confessing God's attributes and we're just standing in awe of Him. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not, in, I'm not suggesting that there is something wrong with it. The, 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 the bottom line with prayer is that prayer needs to be sincere. It's not about a formula. You know, it's not about if I say this, I'm going to bend God to my will. It's not about here's my checklist of what I always need to do. Prayer needs to come from the heart. And as we, one thing we saw last week over and over again, in each of those areas that spoke on prayer, we are to approach God as a child to a father. Uh, my children, you know what, they come, when it talks about coming boldly before His throne of grace, I talked to my kids about this last night. I said, have you ever approached me think, afraid that I was going to kill you? And they, they, Micah jokingly said, uh, yeah. <laughs> but after the laughter subsided, the reality is no. Why? Because you're my daddy, right? And, and that's the way we approach God. It's not, it, before there was, there was this fear, we were abiding under the wrath of God. And it's not that there's not a holy reverence still, but the point is we come before God understanding we're accepted in the Beloved. We come before God because He's put His Spirit in our hearts crying out, Abba, Father. 
And so we're able to come before him as a child to a father. And that's the way Christ encouraged us to pray. So that was the internal aspect of it. And the individual aspect, the private prayer, what I want to spend the rest of our time today considering is public prayer. We're looking at church order. So what about public prayer? We saw last week at numerous examples of public prayer in Acts. Uh, so we know that uh, you know, entering into our closet doesn't stand opposed to public prayer. Are there guidelines for praying in the assembly? And there are some points that I want to look at this morning that I think are worth considering uh, regarding public prayer that, that kind of distinguishes it from private prayer. And the first point I want to look at this morning is that public prayer should be, be done by those led of the Holy Ghost. Public play, prayer should be done by those led of the Holy Ghost. Look at John 11. John chapter 11. When we assemble together, you remember when, uh, when they were choosing the first deacons? They didn't use the term deacon there. But when there was that issue of the, of the, um, you know, the wid widows that were being neglected and the apostles said, we've got to devote our time to prayer and study the word of God. You guys need to choose you out some men to take care of this. One of the requirements was choose you out some men that are full of the Holy Ghost. Because matters within the church need to be led by the Spirit of God. Uh, you don't choose somebody to handle financial matters just because they're good with the books when it comes to this right here, right? You choose men based on their heart toward God. And, and so that's the, the you got to choose out men, first of all, that are full of the Holy Spirit. Choose out those that are going to do this with an eye, first and foremost, towards God and His glory. That's the way that it's going to work out and be done properly. In John 11 last week, we saw something about public prayer. We saw Jesus' private pr prayer give way to public prayer. And in verse 41, they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, where Lazarus was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. Like I said, you can look in John 11, but you're not going to find that prayer. That was private prayer. That was prayer that we don't have recorded in the Scriptures. We don't know what the specifics were of the things that he said to God, but what, he, what we do know is that at this point, Jesus' private prayer turns into a public prayer. And Why does he say that was the case? Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand by, I said, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. His public prayer was for the benefit of those that were gathered there. It was for their instruction. And so that's something that we need to understand regarding public prayer. Public prayer is a form of teaching. It's a form of instruction. You're having an influence upon others when you pray publicly. You're, you're influencing them in the things that their mind ought to be considering as they're praying, right? When we pray together and someone leads us in prayer, what are you doing if you're the one sitting on the bench being silent? You're praying along the same lines, right? You're praying concerning the same. That individual is leading you into the areas that you ought to be praying, what the focus is in this particular hour. So th there, is, there is an instruction there as public prayer is made. That's why Jesus spoke out loud here was for the benefit of those that were gathered there. We are talking to God just like Jesus was, but we're speaking out loud and guiding the ones that hear us into the same prayer. We're teaching others what to pray. We're conveying to others what God has taught us, right? When we pray out loud. So uh, we're instructing through public prayer. If, if public prayer then is, for, is to benefit those who hear it, then public prayer ought not be cold and formulaic, right? right. If, if public prayer is benefiting those that hear it, then it's important when we pray publicly as we're assembled together. You know what? If I'm the guy that's up here that's responsible for calling on someone to pray, it matters who I call on. Right? Because I'm about to give someone the floor, so to speak. I'm giving them an op opportunity to speak among the assemblies. It's not just a matter of simply picking somebody to fill that time. You see what I mean? You want the prayer to be led of the Holy Spirit. You want the prayer to be unto God and also for the benefit of those that hear. You want that prayer to be doctrinally sound, right? So there is, a, there is a serious 
weight and that responsibility. The prayer should be led by those who realize the weight of that responsibility that will cry out to God and pray in the assembly of the saints in, as guided by the Spirit of God. What good is prayer that's not Spirit-led? Look at Romans 8, Romans chapter 8, in verse 26. If this verse is true right here, prayer absolutely has to be Spirit-led. Romans 8 and verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray. How about that? We know not what we should pray for as we ought. So what do we need? We need the Spirit of God to make intercession. Listen, to pray publicly, your need is not any less than the need that we have that stand in the pulpit. I'm speaking among the assembly of the saints. I, who is sufficient for these things? We know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Prayer needs to be Spirit-led. Those that pray in the assembly of the saints should do so in the Spirit. Look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 and in verse number 18, we've got the one weapon set forth in verse 17. We've just heard about this recently, the, the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And right along with that, he throws in verse 18 here, praying always with all prayer and supplication how? In the Spirit in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. When we pray in the assembly of the saints, it should be done in the Spirit. It needs to be done in the Spirit, praying always in the Spirit, it says. 1 Corinthians 14, uh, we won't go there, but we're going to look at that, Lord willing, later, but... 1 Corinthians 14 has a lot to do to say about church order. Uh, and we're going to definitely spend some time there in the coming weeks. But one of the things that 1 Corinthians 14 says is that there is a basic rule when we assemble the together. And it is this. Let all things be done unto edifying. Everything ought to be unto edification. So if you're questioning, should we do this as we assemble together? Here's what you need to measure that up against. Is it for edification? Is it going to build up the church of Jesus Christ? Is it, going to be, is it going to encourage them in the most holy faith? So that's what we're supposed to do as we gather together regarding the people of God. Uh, it is everything's supposed to be under edification, building up in the Lord. Look at Jude 20. Jude 20. Listen to what it says in Jude 20. We'll do that. We'll edify. We'll build up the church of Jesus Christ. Verse 20, But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, doing what? Praying. Praying in the Holy Ghost, right? Prayer in the assembly of the saints has got to be Spirit-led. It's got to be uh, done by those that are going to be guided by the Spirit, that those in whom the Spirit of God dwells. Praying in the Holy Ghost. In contrast to that, verse 19 is speaking of these who uh, these be they who separate themselves. Most translations read right there in that portion, those who cause divisions. Who are those that cause divisions, that are going to cause tears and divisions and schisms among the body? These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not what? Spirit. Having not the Spirit. Prayer needs to be Spirit-led. Amen? Prayer needs to be done within the assembly. Public prayer needs to be done by those that possess the Spirit of God. That will build up, that will edify the church of Jesus Christ. So it is important to call on the right people for public prayer, right? There's a serious responsibility in that for the one that's doing the calling on and for the one that was called on. It's no less serious than the one that stands in the pulpit. 
Would you sit under a preacher? Would you stick somebody in the pulpit that's not guided by the Spirit of God? I hope not. I hope you wouldn't sit under preaching that without that confidence that the Spirit of God is guiding that individual. Well, then likewise, those that pray among the assembly of the saints should be led of the Spirit of God. So public prayer should be done by those led of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because others are taught. Others are influenced as public prayer is made. Second point. Go to, um, go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go back to our main text. First Timothy chapter two. Um, let, let's begin in verse one because I want to see. I want you to see the flow of this thing. Verse one begins with this idea of prayer. This is what, what's been our our jumping off verse over the last several weeks. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. I want you to notice the phrase, all men, in verse number one. Everybody. For this is good and acceptable uh, in the sight of God our Savior. Why ought we to pray for all men? We're going to hear that again in verse four. How can we pray for those that have done us harm? For God, uh, the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. Jesus prayed for His afflictors upon the cross. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. There's that word men again. The man. There it is again. Christ Jesus. Why are we focusing on men in verse 1 and verse 4 and verse 5? Because when we get down to verse 8, guess what word we're going to find? Men. But I want you to see a distinction here. There is one God and mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. I will therefore that who? Men. Pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath, and doubting. We mentioned this word last week in praying for giving. We're to pray without wrath. Now this is one of those times where it's really helpful to look back at the original Greek because unless you saw the original you would never know that the word men in verse number 8 is a different word from men in verse 1 and men in verse 4 and men and man in verse 5. Verse 1, verse 4, and verse 5 Men is that generic term that we use for humanity. Humankind. Human beings. And you know what? That's a real blessing to the ladies because in verse 5, He is the man, Christ Jesus. Not that He's of the male sex. He is the human being, Christ Jesus. He's touched with the feelings of all our infirmities. Don't you like that? Don't you like the fact that there is one mediator between God and man? The man, the human being. He entered into flesh and blood. He experienced, I don't care whether you're man, woman, old, child, whatever. Christ has been in your shoes. And so because He's been tempted in all points like as we are, He's able to help us in every need. Amen? He's able to help us as one that's been there that says, I understand that firsthand. But he says in verse 8, he uses a totally different word in verse 8. I will therefore that men, the male sex. This is literally a man. Literally a male. Pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And we, we see that clearly in verse 9 because he's going to make a distinction. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel and shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. And then he says this in verse 11, let the women learn in silence with all subjection. He's still talking about prayer. He's still dealing with this topic of prayer. Verse 8 said men ought to pray everywhere, everywhere, 
without limitation, lifting up holy hands without wrath, without wrath and doubting. And then he ends into this conversation concerning the women and he speaks of modesty. And he says in verse 11, keep silence with all subjection. I believe that we've got biblical grounds to say that only the men, when the saints are assembled together, should lead in prayer. I don't think it's any different than saying only men should be those that preach. I think the Scripture's clear concerning that. I was at a funeral recently at a large church, and at the end of the funeral, you know, we were all gathered together, and we were singing these songs and praising God, and the Gospel was preached, and then a woman, they called on a woman to close us in prayer, and, and it, there was a catch in my spirit. And, and then, lo and behold, we're studying this right here. And we see that there's a distinction there, and he says in verse 8, I'm speaking about men, the male sex here. He changes word, the words that he uses concerning men. The instruction is that men should be the ones leading in prayer when all the saints assemble together. I wanted to look at that because when you, you see other churches don't do that, and that's the way we handle things here. Is that biblical? I think so. If, if, if it's a form of teaching, right? We just established that by the Word of God. Jesus prayed this prayer for the benefit of those gathered there then are women to teach among the saints. When all the saints are together, gathered together, men included in the congregation, the Bible says no. So congregational prayer should be led by men. Are we saying that men, women do not, should not be in attendance and laboring along with these men in prayer? Absolutely not. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Are the, the prayers of the ladies any less effectual than the men's? Absolutely not. In fact, in Christ Jesus, there is no male nor female, right? And in Acts chapter 1 here, uh, l listen to what we, we see regarding their laboring in prayer. We have, the, uh, uh, we have them gathered together in the upper room, and we have the apostles listed in verse 13. And verse 14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with who? The women, right? With the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with His brethren. Look at Acts chapter 4. And uh, in Acts chapter 4, and in verse number 24, all the congregation is gathered together, and uh, when the apostles come back and they, they talk about how they forbid them to preach in the name of Jesus anymore, it says, when they heard that, verse 24, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, Thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. I don't think that means that they all said exactly the same words. I, mean, I think it means someone led them in prayer and they were all praying the same thing in their hearts, lifting their voices to God in their hearts. They all prayed together. And, and in verse 31, And when they had prayed, uh, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spake the word of God with boldness. But you know what? Even when I see that, I can't find one place in the Scripture where I see that public prayer is led by a woman. I can't find any example of that. If you can find it and correct me, then show me, please. But I couldn't find any example of that. So I think it's biblical that where we call on men during the prayers uh, of, uh, within the service as the saints assemble together. Why does it say in verse number 9 of 1 Timothy 2, why does it say in like manner? Did you notice that? I will, therefore, that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And then uh, verse 9 begins, in like manner. The, the literal translation there reads, so also. It, it, why does it read that? Because it's continuing on this thought regarding prayer. The men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And so also, women, they should be marked by modesty as they gather together among the saints. And let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12 says, But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now what is Paul's basis for saying this? I've heard this over and over and over again. People say, the reason Paul said this is because of the culture of the time. It had to be this way because of the way that they viewed women in their day and age. And so a woman never, a man just would have shut down if a woman tried to teach. But that's not what Paul's basis is for saying this. Did you, do you see where he goes back to when he establishes the foundation for this principle? For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. He goes all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> 
and says, this is something God established in the garden. It ought to be this way because this is a principle that God established from the very beginning. Men pray everywhere while women are marked by meekness and modesty as the church assembles together. And he says, I make this point concerning women not teaching or taking authority over the men and keeping a silence in the assembly. Why? Because of the relationship that God established with Adam and Eve in the garden. Notwithstanding, verse 15, she shall be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. I can only imagine the way that verse has been twisted over the years. There's no telling what kind of crazy doctrine has come out of that. I think that's, in, that's basically referring us back again to the garden. What happened whenever man fell into sin? What was one of the consequences for the woman? Childbirth, right? It's got, childbirth is going to be a painful thing. You're going to have to deal with pain as men are brought forth into the world. And this is saying, you know what? The consequences of sin, there's hope regarding the consequences of sin through faith. There is a new birth. There is a childbearing that those that are a part of that, they overcome that which happened in the garden and those consequences that sin brought on. I'm out of time. I, I, wanted, I had a third point I wanted to get to, but um, even that second point there, I felt like we were a little rushed. Any thoughts as we close? It's interesting when you stop and think about all this, things that maybe you hadn't thought about before, Brother Gary. I've heard a preacher say one time a long time ago when he talked about being led of the Spirit, he said he liked to hear a man's voice change while he was praying. Yeah. His attitude changed. Right. It's like the Spirit falls on him. Mm. Yeah. The weight of that, right? And, and, and we sense our need of Him. We saw that last week, to be seen of men. There's a difference when people, if they're praying to be seen of men, right? You don't see the difference in that spirit. Oh, I told you I want to crawl under the bench <laughs> when it's time to be called on the prayer. I hope I'm not running from responsibility, but it's just because of the weight of that. Because it is a serious matter to pray in the assembly of the saints.